Okay, good morning to everyone. Let's uh, begin this class and uh, a week with a word of prayer. Shall we start? Okay, let's uh, pray and request uh, Sister Chaya. Are you able to pray, Sister? If you can unmute and pray, please. Yeah. Can you hear me, Pastor? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Dear Jesus, we thank you, Father, for this morning. Peace, O oh Lord Jesus, Father, and the joy you are going to give us learning through your word, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father. Father, as we are starting the class, O oh Lord, let your spirit be there in us, O oh Lord Jesus, Father. Give us sound mind and attentive ears, O oh Lord, and help us to learn, understand, and practice it, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father. Bless Pastor and bless all the students, O Lord Jesus, Father. Thank you once again for all of us and especially Pastor Nancy, Lord. Lead us, guide us, and be with us throughout the class. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, everyone. We'll um, begin this morning. We saw till the fact that Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin and only answered the Sanhedrin and so uh, the Sanhedrin perceived that these men though being untrained and uneducated were with Jesus and that's where they got their boldness. So verse 14 it very clearly says seeing the man who had been healed standing with them they could say nothing against it. So this is a reminder for us when God does a supernatural work it's very real. Uh, no one can question a true and genuine work of God. And that's what you and I must look for as believers and as ministers of God. When God does something supernatural, you know, we don't have to shout and we don't have to repeatedly say God did, God did. Because the miracle in itself is good enough. Uh, a person's healing is good enough or a change in their life is good enough to show the world that God is alive, that God is at work. So in this situation, that's exactly what happened. The leadership could not question. What can they say? The man could not walk for 40 years. They all knew. The same man is standing with them. Now, what can you question? You can't. So that was the situation of the Sanhedrin at that time. And praise God, praise God for um, notable miracles which are which speak of God's glory that nobody could can deny. And that's exactly what it says here. They could say nothing against it. When miracles happen, healings happen, that's a genuine miracle. Nobody can say anything. Because it's so real. It ha actually happened. And it actually um, transformed the life or the lifestyle of that person. Now let's continue. From verse 15. They did not know what to do in the situation, the leadership. And so we are told, when they had commanded them to go aside, out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So this simply says that the rulership was fearful. They didn't know what action to take. They could not even discuss in front of Peter and John. So they asked them to go aside and conferred among themselves is like, a, uh, you know, like a huddle. They're discussing, okay, now what to do? What shall we do with these men? Many a time, as we speak about the Sanhedrin, people also comment and say that maybe, maybe Apostle Paul would have been a part of this, this group, the Sanhedrin. He too may have been a part of the discussion when they conferred. Now, we, we don't uh, explicitly see that confirmed anywhere, but it's a speculation. So the discussion, what to do with these? people if they if they uh, kill them then the, there will be a public uproar because a real miracle has taken place but if they don't do anything they will be in trouble isn't it their power their authority will be in trouble so it's a tricky decision to make and they're asking what shall we do with these men so as they discuss 
again notice in verse 16 it, it what are they saying they are saying indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident so they are also not able to deny it this is what we must pray for in our churches in our fellowships in our gatherings in our worship in our supernatural our god your miracles are real they are notable unquestionable when it takes place let them take place oh god you know you do more miracles that's the kind of miracles that took place in the book of acts nobody needed to go and fight for it to say no it's real it's real no it was in front of the people to see and praise god so even the leadership is saying notable miracle has taken place it's evident finally what did they actually decide uh, they felt that this message about Jesus and the work of these men should not continue. So they decided, let us severely threaten them that from now on they should not speak in this name to any man. So that's what they decided. They can't punish them. They can't let them go free. But OK, let us threaten them and tell them, you go. But don't ever speak in the name of this man. Who is this man? Jesus. Don't speak in his name. So that was the final decision. So that's what they did. They called them. They commanded them not to teach in the name of Jesus. What was the response of Peter and John? What do you think? They're being threatened now. So should they say, OK, we will not speak in Jesus' name? Okay, let's listen to the response. Verse 19. Can someone read out verse 19, please? Acts 4 and verse 19. But Peter and John answer and say to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judged mm. look at their answer okay they didn't say okay we want they are saying is it right for us to listen to you or to listen to god you tell us they conclude they say in verse 20 we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard so when this was the situation the leadership, what they did is they threatened them even more. They threatened them more and um, uh, they could not punish them, but they just threatened them and uh, they let them go. So what do you think about the response of Peter and John? They are going against the instruction of the governmental authorities. Is it right? They said they'll continue to teach in the name of Jesus. So is that how we should we should respond as believers to government? <laughs> okay, with the world word. Okay, we should not contradict with the word. Yeah. So you see, the Bible, it was Apostle Paul who wrote that you must pray for the governments right when uh, we read about it in romans 13 we read about it in the writings to timothy he says pray for all men especially for those who are in leadership those who are in authority so there is a sense of honor for people in government and uh, positions of authority but at the same time when authority uh, interferes with worshiping and you know our obedience to god so if they're asking us to do something which becomes disobedience and dishonor dishonor to god um, we see that these people are not listening the believers or the early church apostles so that is an example for us think about daniel daniel and uh, the three men 
they were asked to bow down to the uh, image of their king. But they said, no, we can't. They were told, we'll put you in the fire. They say, OK, fine. If our God saves us, let him save. Otherwise, else it's fine. So that's their um, attitude. When we are told not to worship God, at that point, you know, they, they say, sorry, we can't. All other things, yes. We will follow. We will keep the rules. We will uphold. We are not doing anything against the authorities. But when there is an instruction to not um, worship God, it's then that you know these people are denying and saying sorry. You know, you even though you're telling us to do this, we can't. And the authorities were not able to do anything. They just thought, okay, let's threaten them. Let's let them go and let's let's see what happens. So they let them go. And it was, a, as we said earlier, a tricky situation because public uproar would have been there seeing a man who is well after 40 years. All right. So now John and Peter are released. And uh, where do they go? Where do you think they went? To have a cup of coffee, <laughs> just came out of the prison to worship. Yes. So that was the way they loved God and the way the early church community was devoted to God. They went back to their own companions, or in other words, their church, you know, their brethren, their leadership, their eldership. They straight went back to their church and um, they told them. Look, this is what happened. This is what the chief priests told us. The elders told us. And uh, the team members heard them out. And guess what they did? You know, they all began to pray. They all began to pray. So that is the way the um, church responded to persecution. It was a praying church. OK, we find ourselves in this situation. What should we do? Pray. They knew only to pray. Okay, So it's a praying church. They start to pray. In verse 24, we see they raise their voice to God. And with one accord. Remember one accord. We read about it earlier also in Acts 1. Uh, in the upper room, they were together in one accord. So uh, the early church gives us a picture of a uh, united body of believers. Is it possible to be together physically and not agree? We can be together, but our hearts are far away. Is that possible? Yeah. So instead of only saying they all gathered together and prayed, every now and then Luke is saying one accord, one accord. One accord means hearts are also united. Physically, we are present together, but our hearts are also united. So how can we engage in powerful prayer when our hearts are united, when we are agreeing for God to work? So they gather together and they raise their voice to God with one accord. So in the situation of persecution, the church is praying. They are praying. And what are their prayer requests? They exalt God. They say, God, you are the one. You made heaven and earth and everything in it. And, uh, you know, look at this world. Look at this world. They quote from the uh, earlier scriptures. And they say, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So what are they saying? You know, they're saying, God, even though you are great, why is it that uh, authorities in the world are not able to recognize you? And people are even uh, trying to campaign against you, oh God. They're amazed. How can this be? And even though this is happening, here are their prayer requests. What are they? They say, uh, look on their threats, O God, and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Verse 29. So this is the prayer request. They have just come out of a situation of persecution. We may think that their prayer request will be, God protect us. 
God, remove, you know, remove those leaders, uh, let them be fired, <laughs> let them not be in their position, something like that. But see what these people are asking God for. They are asking God, give us, O oh God, boldness to speak your word. Give your people, your servants, boldness. Isn't that amazing? Why would somebody who has just come out of investigation ask for more boldness? But that's how they were. They just said, Lord, we are not going to stop. We are going to preach more. Give us more boldness. So that is uh, how they went ahead despite the setbacks. Second prayer request, verse 30. They said, by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Second prayer request is, we want more signs, wonders, healings. One is prayer request number one, boldness. Prayer request number two, signs, wonders, healings. In other words, the supernatural. So when persecution is taking place, what should we pray for? This is a good pattern. We can take these prayer requests and say, God, give us boldness in these difficult times. Give us boldness to proclaim your word. We can also say, Lord, you do more miracles. See, now because of one miracle, nobody could open their mouth. It was a notable miracle. Now, if many miracles start taking place, healings start taking place, people can't deny that. It's very real. So let more miracles take place. So we can pray that for our church. We can pray that for persecuted communities, persecuted churches, pastors whom we know, and say, Lord, give them more boldness. Do more signs, Lord, more wonders, more healings through their ministry. So that's how they prayed. And when they had prayed, this is supernatural. Verse 31. Okay. It's amazing. It says, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. So a uh, natural manifestation took place. What was that? They were praying. And you can imagine like an earthquake. The earth is shaking. Okay, have we ever had any such supernatural experiences that when we are praying or we are worshipping, something happens? I've seen once, uh, they recorded that uh, on video. Uh, it was a time when a preacher, he is praying for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And they've captured it. Somebody was recording it. So it's all captured. The weather is calm. It's calm, okay? No breeze, no nothing. He just says, oh God, like on that day, you sent a rushing mighty. The moment he says rushing mighty wind, the wind just comes. Everything on the stage is shaking and, you know, things are flying. And he, like we don't expect a manifestation, right? God need not give such a manifestation. I'm just saying that sometimes, sometimes, now we don't know why certain times God does that, but in that, I've seen a manifestation. Like the moment he starts praying for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, there's again winds and everything. And, you know, this man is praying, an elderly minister of God. Um, uh, and that was like supernatural. Like just gives you goosebumps to see uh, God manifested his presence like that. In this case also, when they all prayed together, something supernatural happened. Every time we have a prayer meeting, will the earth shake? No, we should not expect it also. Earth shakes or not, when we pray heaven shakes, that's enough for us. But sometimes there can be natural manifestations. Uh, and if they happen, it's fine. Maybe God is trying to communicate something or just demonstrate his power. And that day it happened. The earth shook. Now, after this happened, what about the church community? We continue to see that the church community is growing. And you remember in Acts chapter 2, they were so gracious and so loving towards one another. They were even selling their things 
and providing for the needs of others. So the ch church community is continuing in the same way. Now, one of us, can, I, can you just read that passage about the church community from verse 32 to verse 35? Now the multitude of those who believed were of the one heart and one soul, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all were possessed. Uh, possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were to sold and led them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Mm, amen. So, what are some features? Now, the church has been growing, the work is continuing. What is the attitude of the church? What are um, the characteristics of the growing church one they those who believe were of one heart and one soul so unity unity was there in the church when the church people of the church are united in their heart it's a powerful thing and the early church was like that one heart and one mind so such a beautiful picture uh, then they were generous. It says they were generous. How do we know? They did not, um, you know, the things that they had also, they did not say that any of the things they possessed was their own, but they had all things in common. So meaning a sharing church, caring church. Why? We already saw the re reason. Many people had come, stayed back in Jerusalem, continued with the church. And they didn't go back to their own city. So they had to start off their lives. People were in need. And uh, the church folk were willing to give, willing to uphold. So helping the brothers, helping the families in the church to come up or to have what they need. Later, you see there, verse uh, 34, it says, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked so in such a way, their generosity was demonstrated that there was nobody in the church who did not have the essentials. Everyone had like clothes, food, shelter, whatever they needed, everyone had in the church. Um, in fact, those who possessed land, they sold it. So we are talking like big money. They sold it. And what did they do? The the returns whatever they got out of selling the land they came and they gave it or they laid it at the apostles feet and distributed to anyone who has need so we are looking at a united church and we are looking at a very generous church where nobody lacks anything now in the last class also i told us this does not mean that even today we are expected to sell whatever we have to give. What are we expected to do? We are expected to help meet the needs of people around us, of course. Okay, we can do that. Uh, however, later on in the, in the writing to the Thessalonians, Paul talks about working hard. He talks about laboring. Uh, we, we know even regarding Apostle Paul himself that he was a tent maker. He had a job to earn for his own living and he served the Lord, you know, you could say full time or overtime. Uh, so the meaning of being generous is not to encourage a dependency mindset, but it, it means that when there's a need, we meet it. But overall, we help people to become independent. We help them to become responsible. So we should not encourage uh, carelessness, lethargy, uh, laziness, or uh, you know, dependence 
in a in a very irresponsible way so that's not generosity there are that's two different aspects generosity and taking care of those who lack is one thing but uh, encouraging laziness and irresponsible behavior is another thing so we should not be doing the the second uh, description you know, that i presented so this church was uh, basically helping those in need but of course later on people became more stable and there was no need to sell like this and all and give and uh, apart from this what about the apostles you know we saw it's a uh, um, united church very generous church as far as the apostles are concerned uh, they were moving with power they were moving with power because we notice here the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the lord jesus great grace was upon them all grace is enabling god's enabling so we know that the apostles would have done a wonderful work preaching the gospel providing leadership to the growing church community um, moving in signs wonders and miracles many things making decisions so the apostles also were enabled by god to stand up and do the work that god called them to and think about this the apostles would have never known that they have to manage this kind of money you need integrity right as a leader of the church we they just preached about jesus and now so many people have become believers and now suddenly they are being given money they laid it at the apostles feet sell the land and laid it at the apostles feet it's a little scary because now as a leader you have to manage that kind of money um but we will see that they they were people of integrity the apostles they did not take that money they did not misuse that money but uh, they did a good job of distributing the money in a righteous way uh, so as a leader you know many times we could find ourselves in positions where you, we feel god i just wanted to preach you know i just wanted to lead worship i just wanted to pray what is all this you know i have to do admin work i have to manage finances i have to uh, do other things organize uh, but we need grace and that's what scripture say great grace was upon them god gave grace okay you need to do all these tasks you can do it and you do it well and the apostles were doing a good job now money was given to them to uh, take care of the needs of the people and from now slowly we will see new names till now we were only stuck with the disciples names you know peter john um, all of those but starting now the church community is growing thriving there are people of influence in the church community that the focus will start uh, coming to from verse 36 we read about a man by the name of barnabas his name was joseph but he was also called as barnabas um the meaning of his name is son of encouragement and was he a man of encouragement what do you think yeah he was a man of encouragement is very um, gracious to people what else do we know about him we know that he was a levite so uh, he's from a respected tribe and um, he's from the country of cyprus so he's a devout man devout man of god encourager and also a very generous man generous what a wonderful person in the church you know to have a barnabas how is how do we know he's generous verse 37 says having land sold it brought the money laid it at the apostles feet so he was also one of those generous people who gave their possessions to meet the needs of those who are lacking in the church community so that's the end of um, acts chapter 4 any anything that you want to talk about before we proceed with uh, chapter 5 ah uh, yes yes neena uh, may i unmute and can you hear me first of? yes yes we can hear you please go ahead okay. uh yeah about that uh, uh the uh, reaction of uh, 
Peter and John, I mean, after they were questioned by the authorities about, mm. you know, that they should not be doing what they were doing. Yes. Um, so there was no, at that point of time, I was just thinking and I was looking that it was within the uh, premises of the temple that they did that, right? So mm. at that time, probably there was no specific rule as such that they should not, I mean, do such things. Was there anything? And uh, I'm not saying that, you know, so they replied what they did mm. and said, mm. we will have to listen to God. Yes. rather than to you when we do these things yes okay? so so yeah. that, that was the, they 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 could say that today also i mean I'm, I'm trying to relate it to today mm. uh, so within our um, uh, i mean the churches or within that when we pray for uh, people and there are there are miracles that are happening and all of that yeah okay. I, I, i'm sure that i mean that's quite uh, all right i mean there's nothing but in case there mm. is a restriction in uh, for us to do. I mean, us. When I say us, it's Christians and uh, uh, those who have these uh, the meetings or whatever in a public space. If there are restrictions like that from the government, then what should be our stand? Okay. Um, yes, Nina. Nina, you you have something more to add to the question, or no, no, just that, just to okay. Yeah. Yes. So, see, we must be upholders of the law, even though our government, like uh, our own government, has certain certain uh, articles uh, that allow for people to share their faith. There are other other guidelines as well. Like, for example, you you stated uh, in a public space, if we want to share the um, share about uh, Christ. See, we need to be mindful of how we do it. The point that we saw here is if someone is asking us to not, like very directly, like you can't worship God and you must deny Christ or something to that effect, then of course we can't, we can't go by what they're saying. Uh, our response will be like Peter and John and also Daniel and his friends. But if it is about uh, following the guidelines of a public space, uh, I believe that we must uphold the law. We, we should not do things in such a way that you know we break rules. So we can still share the gospel, we can still worship without breaking rules, guidelines. So in that sense, we will we will uphold it. But if it comes to you know, someone saying you deny uh, Christ, that instruction we cannot follow. I hope uh, that uh, addresses your question. Yes, I mean I think we have that freedom. No, I mean to mm. obviously follow our faith. That goes, yes, no, actually, I'm, yeah, that that there is no doubt there that I mean, ah. we will continue to do that. Just that this kind of a pub thing which got that attention of all the people and they, and they decided mm. to do what they did. And mm. then they were able to respond and say, no, because they were asking them not to preach in the name of Jesus. Mm. So I was mm. trying to relate it. I mean, I said, if there is a parallel, then, you know, what, what should be our response? This, of course, that we don't, certainly we, nobody can tell us that we cannot... Uh, you know, cannot uh, you uh, like yeah, you stop, you yeah. can't share Christ. So those that instructions obviously yeah. we can't uh, follow because we don't need it's to follow, against yeah. the very fiber of what uh, yeah. we have been in uh, commissioned by Christ. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I know the this this whole thing is quite uh, uh challenging, but thank God as as we saw uh, last time, right? That reference from Matthew where uh, Jesus said, if you find yourself in a situation like this, I will give you the words. So uh, we must depend on that. Trust God to help us answer when we are questioned. Huh. I'm, yeah. I'm saying again, sorry to come back to that. No, no. When there okay. are specific rules, uh, ah. like suppose now, I mean, I don't know how it is now, uh, but I think certain places they don't really allow public meetings because certain mm. places when you go, they say you can't. 
even like say even in an apartment complex yes uh, they they will say no you you cannot have it like you know with, with a mic an open space no they say yeah. it's okay yeah. if you can have it in a hall like that that's what i meant so yes, there are yes. those restrictions and we'll have to be mindful of the those is we what i'm saying of course we we have to be mindful to the best yeah. that we can we have to be mindful about the rules guidelines laws um of the yeah. land yeah yes sure thank you yeah thank you thank you so much all right so we've now seen the introduction of this man called barnabas um who is generous so at this time many people are giving to god so we've already observed that okay so there is a couple by the name of ananias and sapphira so this is the beginning of acts chapter 5 where this couple similar to barnabas they are selling their possession <coughs> but they did one thing which was displeasing to god verse 2 says they kept back part of the proceeds both of them knew about it so both of them were in agreement to do this and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles feet what was the problem with ananias and sapphira's generosity now they uh they gave this money but they pretended like they gave all the money which they got after selling their possessions whereas that was not the fact they kept little bit behind but it was a pretense peter one of the apostles when he received this money he rebukes them he says ananias why has satan filled your heart to lie to the holy spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself while it remained was it not your own and after it was sold was it not in your own control why have you conceived this thing in your heart you have not lied to men but to god he rebukes ananias so what is peter saying first thing how did peter know between husband and wife they have decided that they will give the money like as if they're giving the full money they know they've kept a part with them how did peter come to know word of knowledge gifts of the holy spirit there are we we've seen right nine gifts one of the gifts of the holy spirit is operating in peter so nobody needed to tell him by the holy spirit peter knew hey you're trying to cheat this is not correct he catches them and he says while the money was yours everything was in your control what does that tell us it tells us that nobody was forced to give they if they ananias and sapphira never gave it was okay no need no problem but what the problem was that they uh, loved money they kept some money back second they were lying pretense which is what hurt god's heart okay um now also see that he says you have not lied to men but to god in the first line there he says satan filled your heart to lie to the holy spirit whom did they lie to holy spirit and then later he says you have not lied to men but to god so holy spirit same holy spirit and god so we've learned this when we did the course for holy spirit the holy spirit is not just um you know like a a feeling or holy spirit is not a, just a presence a power a force uh holy spirit is a person and the third person of god we generally refer to him like that he is god himself is god himself and throughout the book of acts holy spirit is working he's guiding the people even now when this couple are lying holy spirit knows all things he knows the hearts of the people how much money we give that is different more important what is in the heart how is our heart so peter is saying look god the holy spirit knows that you are lying 
and he rebukes them such a shock imagine they would have thought when they give the money everyone will clap or they'll be called to the stage and they say oh ananias safira gave so much money but it was not like that there was a rebuke so what does that tell us god sees the heart the way jesus said it's uh, one the woman the widow gave two only two coins but uh, a pharisee he gave a lot of money but which one did god find pleasure in it's the woman who gave her all she gave her all it was about her heart in this case the money was big but the heart was not good uh, and so what is the result very scary result was five ananias hearing these words fell down and breathed his last so great fear came upon all those who heard these things one lie one mistake consequence death the man died as soon as he heard peter speak we can ask the question you know we we will read further in uh, the next class uh, same thing happened to his wife she also died immediately why do you think this happened why was the judgment so severe yes he lied but should he die for that okay let me just briefly put it this way we'll discuss in the next class when there is a great grace of god great glory of god okay usually when we see even revivals take place a mighty move of god judgment is quite quick we don't understand how this happens but it happens so um in the book of acts the power of god the move of god was mighty and uh, even the smallest sin drew judgment and we are like how can this happen god like he lied okay uh, but god is so holy um, that the small the small issue is still a big issue because he's a holy god that is point 1 second at the time of great glory god does not let as per man we may think oh it's minor but even those things draw consequence and that's exactly what happened to ananias there was great glory great grace we spoke about it great favor it it's a revival a move of the spirit and in the move of the spirit here are people sinning against god lying to god judgment immediately the man died it's quite scary okay so uh, that also shows us how holy um, and just god is he cannot tolerate any any deviance from his nature okay so with that we will uh, stop for today so that we can pick it up in the next class i request uh, one of us to kindly lead in prayer as we close off father god we thank you lord thank you for this time you have given us to study your word lord lord we all of us submit and teach us lord and we thank you lord that whatever we everything what we heard lord help us to remember this and use it in our life lord In jesus name we pray amen amen thank you everyone have a wonderful day and a great week ahead thank you bye